John Hooks Newsmaker starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker. The U.S. southern border is being overrun. There is no delicate way to put it. The numbers are simply astonishing. Never before in our nation's history have we seen unbridled migration like this. The number of illegals who've entered the U.S. since President Biden took office now exceeds the population of 22 states. Art Del Cueto, National Border Patrol Council, joins me now. Art, thank you very much. You did this for 18 I years. It. Yeah, it's great to have you. You did this for 18 years. You know what's happening. But I'll tell you what, I'm not sure still that the country fully appreciates the level that we're seeing. These numbers are insane. It, it, it is insane, and it's been insane from day one from this administration. And just to be clear, when I do a lot of these you know, uh, areas where I speak about the issues, I don't speak on behalf of the agency. I, I need to be clear with that. But uh, I have been on, uh, it's been over 20 years. Um, and, uh, and and that's why I, I want to clear it up that, you know, I don't speak on behalf of them. Uh, but obviously, I, I speak on behalf of the National Border Control Council. And it is, it's the numbers are staggering. It's nonstop. Every single week, you have a new record that is broken. Uh, you know, we just heard last week it was over 15,000. Uh, it broke the, the record from the week before that. Uh, and people need to realize, you know, this is strategic. The drug cartels know what they're doing. A lot of the stories that you have heard throughout the, couple, the last couple of years are what's happening in Texas. But uh, Arizona has continued to lead the country for a, a numerous uh, amount of time on gotaways. And those are the individuals, obviously, like the word says, it's the ones that got away. And where it's important is people need to understand that individuals that are coming into the U.S. right now are from 168 different countries. Uh, it's not just, you know, a couple of countries here or there. It's 168 different countries from around the world. They realize that if they come across right now, all they have to do is ask for asylum and they get released. And that's why they're coming in large numbers, because when you come in these large numbers, it distracts the agents. The agents have to respond to those areas. They have to do the transport. Sometimes they got to do the hospital watch. They obviously have to do the processing. What does that do? That leaves more areas with more gaps, longer downtime, where now the cartels can take advantage of that and bring drugs into the country. And it's been happening in record number out here, unfortunately, in Arizona. All right, I want to throw a couple of numbers at people because, again, it is staggering. U.S. Customs and Border Protection reports that over 5 million illegals were encountered at America's southern border between the start of the Biden administration and this past March 31st. So the numbers are even more than that. Of those 5 million, at least 2.46 million had no confirmed departure from the U.S., meaning they're here, they're staying, and until a court date maybe six, seven years down the line determines otherwise, they're here. And, and you know, even if the court date determines that, you know, these people, they're not going to show up to the court date. That's part of the problem is, you know, they realize it's a free for all come across. And a lot of those individuals that are coming across now that you're seeing the staggering numbers in Arizona are individuals from the ages of 18 to 35, military age men. And you're looking at individuals from different parts of Africa, different parts of Maritonia, uh, Serbia, that continue to enter people from Egypt. Uh, and they're coming through and they realize, hey, I'm not leaving. Uh, their, their intentions are not to leave. And I'll tell you how, how, how horrible it is and demoralizing it is for the men and women that are out there protecting our nation's borders is a lot of these individuals, when they're apprehended, they already have, carry a handwritten note, a handwritten note in their pockets. Every single one of them is carrying it. And when they get detained, they hand it over, and that note contains the address of where they're supposedly going to in the United States, uh, a phone number of who's receiving them there, and the, the name and relationship to them of the individuals that are already receiving them in the United States. What does that tell you? That tells you that the word has gotten out throughout the criminal uh, cartels, through the uh, in individuals that are smuggling them into the country, the individuals that are involved in the drug trafficking, the word has gone out and said, hey, this is all they require as long as you give them a name and a number. And, and they're already well uh, instructed to do so when they come across, that's what they hand over to the agent. And that's it. And they're voluntarily, most of them, turning themselves over because they want that. That means, okay, I'm here, I'm in, and I'll be sent on to my next location. Th that is correct. But look, there's still a group. Uh, like I said, the gotaways, it's a huge number of gotaways that have continued to come into the United States. Uh, a lot of them, unfortunately, have, have been, come through the, been coming through uh, the uh, southern Arizona because of, you know, of its remoteness out there 
on the Tohono O'odham Reservation. So it's just, it's more remote. So even when I've talked to some individuals within the media, they said, look, we can get the story in Texas. They can. You can get a story in Texas if, if they go down there and they see, because the entire southern border is in chaos right now. But the story is uh, definitely different in Arizona because of its remoteness. And the cartels realize that, so they're bringing in more numbers. But look, when you start talking about gotaways, it is so easy to enter the United States, hand over that paper and say, I'm here for asylum and get released in the United States. Can you just imagine how horrific the criminal backward, uh, background or the criminal intentions are of those individuals that take that extra step not to even get detected? Are you testified before Congress recently. You said DHS has the funding to handle the border. We don't need new laws. We have laws on the books. We need to enforce them. That's an interesting That's position. Down to look, last, last administration with rhetoric alone, the numbers went down from day one. This administration with rhetoric alone, the numbers uh, shot up astronomically from day one. Uh, what they need to do is they bring immigration judges and asylum officers down to the border. They need to detain people. That word will get out quick that, hey, you don't just have to ask for asylum and get released. Once they realize that they're getting detained, the, the numbers will go down because, you know, hey, now there's a consequence for their actions. And I believe it's Henry Cuellar himself that said, uh, you know, out of Texas, Congressman out of Texas, that of all these individuals that are asking for asylum, he said that less than 7% are actually have a true asylum claim. So what does that tell you? Uh, economic reasons are coming here. Art. I'm curious, I've asked everyone on this program on this subject, why is the Biden administration going this route? What is the goal? I mean, this is obviously a willful change in policy that happened when President Biden took office. There was a shift. There's no denying it. It's a fact. What do you think is the goal to allow this to continue? Look, it, it is so horrific, and I, I've tried to ask myself that question, and all I can think of right now, and it's a horrible answer, but the people that are in charge of the of, the, of this administration, the leadership right now, they're, they're, they're more concerned with the hate that they had towards the last administration than any love they have for this country or the future of America. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to size up what might be happening. Is it possible that they want this to get so much attention that Congress will be forced to do something. At the very least, we, we obviously need to tighten up the asylum laws in this country. Coming over and just claiming asylum and then vanishing into the interior for six, seven years, that doesn't seem to be a very prudent plan. No, it's definitely not, but I guess, you know, they, they, have, they have something in place that they can use to stop it. They're just choosing not to do it. They need the political will to make it stop. Would that be remain in Mexico? Remain in Mexico is one of them. And obviously, look, we're a country of immigrants. We realize that. But we need to have these laws that are, that are on the books be uh, done correctly. And people need to abide by these laws. And there has to be consequences if you break those laws. Okay, you mentioned the Godaways. So let me just give a, a couple more numbers. 2.1 million illegals released into the United States. 1.7 million known gotaways. When I've covered the border years past, the theory was for every one person caught, three were getting in. Is that about right? Uh, you know what? They, they, you have to see the numbers, but unfortunately, there's not even enough agents out there uh, or, or enough of a true scientific way to figure out how many are getting away. But when you're seeing you know, so many individuals come across and you're having agents say, we're, we're, we have individuals detained, and we don't have enough agents to go after the ones that, we're, that we hear coming through, uh, that's already a problem. Art, um, you know, we've mentioned President Biden and the Biden administration several times in this program. There was obviously a shift that happened um, when he took office. There's, again, there's no denying it. What did you see on the border? What dramatically changed in what we were doing before and what happened after? Uh, you, you know, what it was is a lot of it was rhetoric. You know, the rhetoric came out and they just said, look, um, when they were running their campaign, President Biden specifically said, if people come, no one will be turned away, no one will be detained. Uh, and they realized that. So that's why you're getting what you're getting. People from all over the world realize it's a free for all. They realized it, it was from day one. And, and, and as I said, look, uh, we, have, we have laws. 
and, and unfortunately because of people circumventing these uh, these laws and just say, hey, I'm going to come one, come all, just come all, just ask for asylum, get released. A lot of the individuals that are going through the proper steps to get their documentation, they're also suffering, you know, with more wait times because, you know, everyone's cutting in front of the line uh, of them. So unfortunately, uh, the criminals are, are ahead of the game and those that are actually following the law are, are suffering as well. Where, where are we going from here, do you think, Art, on, on this issue? I mean, people are watching this, and, and again, you know, it depends on what news outlet you're going to watch, who's covering it and who's not. To me, it's a story. It seems pretty obvious if you're getting these kind of numbers. Where, where do we go from here? Honestly, it's disastrous. I don't know where to go from here, but every single week we have another record number of individuals coming across and we're gonna need the right political will. We're gonna need the right individuals in office and, and, and people need to really do their homework and, and realize you know, that a lot of these elections, they have a lot of consequences. With the Godaways, how concerned are you about our own national security and who's coming in that we don't know about? Well, it, it's extremely concerning. You know, it's, it's, it's the Godaway, that's what they are. If it's that easy to come across and get released, can you imagine how horrific the criminal background is on those individuals? that uh, are going that extra step. So you're worried there there could be something down the line? Definitely, definitely worried, especially when you're getting large groups of people that have traveled together for a long time and they've been together for such a long time, uh, you know, from a country uh, that's a special interest. And then you get one or two of those individuals in that group that are on the terrorist watch list. How do you not get concerned with the rest of the people that are in the group as well? Art Del Cueto, National Border Patrol Counsel. Art, thank you for spending some time with us on Newsmaker. Thank you for having me. Art Del Cueto. Coming up next, a brother is donating his kidney to save the life of his older brother. We're going to talk to him. Coming up next. Welcome back on Newsmaker. How far would you go to save your older brother? Would you give up one of your kidneys? Mike Robison is about to do that. Mike is a photojournalist here at Fox 10, and he joins me from Ohio, where he's days away right now from a transplant surgery to save his older brother, Steve. Mike, you're doing an amazing thing, and I think a lot of us here at Fox 10 were not aware that you were doing this. It's not one of those things that I made uh, the entire station aware of. It, it's um, I, I held it a little close to the vest because um, it's not something that I, I, I wanted to uh, get a reaction out of anyone, particularly, or or, or get attention or, or or say, "Hey, look at me! Look at what I'm doing! I, I'm doing this for my brother. I'm not doing it for me." And and I'm trying to be a little humble, a little, um, you know, something along those lines about it. But at the same time, um, it is life changing. You're right. And for anyone watching to think, oh, uh, I, I would never be able to do that or, or that's not something I could do. You absolutely can. You can give a kidney. You can give a portion of your liver. You could change someone's life. It, it is it is one of the most powerful things you can do. And and to living donors, or deceased donors, it is such a profound way to shape lives and change lives, and you're doing it. Tell me about Steve. Steve has been, he's been on dialysis now for about a year, as I understand it. Yes. How, um, he's older he's than you by how many years? On and off a lot of his adult life. Um, about two years ago, uh, he went to the hospital, to the emergency room, um, and uh, they, they found that he had beginnings of, of kidney disease. He had diabetes um, and it, uh, it it progressed to the point where uh, a, a kidney doctor is known as a nephrologist. So if I use that term, uh, I've explained it. He met with a nef nephrologist and he mentioned to Steve that this is um, something that uh, you have a problem with your kidneys and um, you might need to start uh, soon after you, they discussed, you might need to start looking at the possibility of, of a, a donor. If you know anyone who would do that, um, we can put you on the waiting list. And um, he had health issues that, again, he was in and out of the hospital. He was not a prime candidate for 
uh, a donation at that time because of those other health issues. But when the time came that he could um, be considered as, okay, I'm a candidate now for a kidney transplant, my sister-in-law, his wife, Tammy, and I, along with Steve, we had discussions with myself, with my our middle brother. Um, could you see yourself as being a donor? And um, I, I said yes. Mike, that that's that is a very tough decision. I don't want to get too personal, but I don't I don't know if your if your brother's issues with his kidney, his kidneys are genetic i mean and, and you've got two everybody's got two it's a great redundancy system in the human body that you've got two and you can operate perfectly fine on one i get all that but uh do you have to kind of assess your own health going down the line and whether you know giving up one puts you at any jeopardy i've been very fortunate to lead a very um healthy lifestyle you know by the grace of god and um going forward when I have one kidney after this donation, it will enlarge slightly, uh, is what I've been told by the oh, doctors, wow. and it will make up for um, only having one. So further health issues down the line in life, I, I hope I have none. Um, they obviously, the doctors, the nursing staff here uh, that I've been meeting with here at Ohio State Medical Center, Ohio State University Medical Center, have said, yes, you'll have to kind of be careful uh, and take care of that one kidney because you don't have a backup now. Um, but um, it's one of those things where I can live with one. You did say it's a great redundancy um, in the human body. We have two lungs, but you can't donate a lung. Um, you have two eyes, but you're not gonna donate an eye. You can donate a kidney, yeah. still live a perfectly healthy life. And um, that's why I've chosen to do this for my, my brother. It'll be life-changing, it'll be life-saving. Mike, take me back to the original discussions when this all kind of came to the fore. So your, your brother, Steve, who's older than you by how, how many years? Nine. Okay. He kind of approaches you and your, and your middle brother to say, is this something you would consider? Once you sure. kind of sign on, is there counseling that's given from the medical center to everybody involved to get everybody kind of prepared for what lies ahead yes about two months ago i came here to columbus to the ohio state university medical center i met with the doctors the surgeon the nephrologist uh social worker um the donation uh donor advocate um and and it was a great staff um all around people working with me talking with me through the process of um when you are approved, when you have achieved that status, the, this is the time frame. This is the window we're looking at. The donor advocate made sure on numerous occasions, um, and, and I, I still have the option. I, I know what my response is, but you can always say no. You can always back out, no questions asked, if you don't feel like you can move forward, that something is telling you this isn't possible. I've always said to her, Dana, I appreciate that, but we're moving forward. If there's no medical reason for me to, to not do this, we're moving forward. It so, is still uh, a brave, it's a brave thing. I mean, did Steve really press you and say, look, Mike, you don't have to do this? Oh, no, no. It, it was never pressure one way or the other. This was my decision. Um, my middle brother uh, does not have quite the support staff waiting for him at home. I've got you. I've got the entire Fox 10 family. I've got my family <laughs> at home. I've, I've got everyone on my side. The, the outpouring of support has been amazing. Been absolutely amazing. Well, you deserve it. I mean, you're being very self-effacing about this, but this is a big, big deal. How arduous is the surgery itself to remove your I, kidney and put it in yeah. your brother, Steve? For me, they said it will be around three to four hours. For him, it will be four to five hours. Um, they said that they will have the kidney out of me and into him within a half hour. And that's, excuse me, that's the magic of living donation. Cadavers and, and um, organs from those individuals who have passed on are great, are life-saving, are life-changing in their own right. But a living donation, that is a live organ being donated straight into yeah. another living body. And, um, 
what's great about that is uh, the nephrologist uh, spoke on this actually a little earlier today is that you can plan the event. You know that on this Friday, you can go in, it'll be taken from Mike within a half hour, it will go into Steve. We can plan this to happen for a cadaver or for, I use that term, it sounds inappropriate, but that, that's the proper term. From a person who's passed on, you can't plan for that. If you're on a waiting list, you kind of just have to take it as it comes yeah, right. and hope for the best, hope the timing works out right. Okay, a lot has been made in the local press there about you are an Ohio State guy, a huge super fan. Your brother is a Michigan fan. <laughs> okay, so... He Mich grew up a Michigan fan. He's I know now that. been a high school referee, and he can't root for a specific team. But, yes, growing up, he was a Michigan fan through and through. And usually those two don't mix, oil and water, right? Right. ASU, UA. It's yeah. not the same rivalry there in Arizona as it is here. Sure. I'm actually in enemy territory in their house as, a, as <laughs> their Michigan uh, <laughs> Michigan family. But um, actually, just him. The rest of the family. Then, okay, so, so on that point, with Michigan just beating Ohio State a week ago, how much stress did that put on this whole thing? Well, this was happening regardless. <laughs> but my, my, my quote that I keep telling Steve is, I'm turning you into a, an Ohio State fan from the inside out, <laughs> one piece at a time. <laughs> that is great. That is hilarious. And my, my hope with this also is by doing this selfless deed, as you said, that this will be the turn that Ohio State needs, karma, to get ah. Ohio State back on the winning track. Okay, I don't know. okay. You're willing to give it up, literally, for, <laughs> literally. for the, the I mean, Ohio State University giving a pound of flesh, right? Mike, what is your recovery going to look like? When will you start to be back at full strength? Um, I'm not even gonna talk about coming back to work. We won't worry about that right now, but what's kind of the recovery timetable for you? I will be out of the hospital. Uh, they're hopeful by uh, Sunday, which would be two days post-surgery. Um, then I stay here in Ohio for anything that would pop up. Uh, and then after two weeks, there's a, a uh, follow-up uh, checkup. And then after that time, I can go back to Arizona, hopefully if everything comes in with a clean bill of health after two weeks. My brother, um, the one who lives in Dallas, who um, uh, was also a possibility, he is coming here, flying back with me to Arizona. They don't even want me pulling my own luggage. That's how little strain they want me lifting, oh, wow. lifting less than... Uh, I think it's five pounds, a five pound weight restriction uh, after two weeks. So um, I'll be at, back in Arizona, hopefully before Christmas to be with my family and um, back to work, fingers crossed, Yeah. Uh, by the end of January, if not a little earlier. Don't push it. <laughs> Take the all news the news you need. Mike, um, really tremendous respect for what you're doing it is a selfless act and uh it's it's really a great thing you're doing you know that but i i just it's it's really it's something to behold i, I just want to say one thing real quick too that anyone can do it there's nothing special about me or, or the, this kidney or that kidney whichever one they, they decide to take out you guys can be a lifesaver a hero and I'm, I'm neither of those things, but there are so many people waiting for organs. Um, and, and to be a living donor, it, it, it's huge. It's huge. It, it changes lives. No, John, we're going to have it up on the screen throughout this program so people can see it. Mike Robinson, great, great to see you, Mike. Best of luck. Um, folks, you should know that Mike is, as we're taping this, two days away from surgery. I would say he is the epitome of poise in the pocket. Mike Robison. Mike, best to you. Give Steve our best and good luck. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday.